Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video number 7. 007. Uh, this video is on speciation and extinction, um, and so it's really on just two things. In other words, it's how we go from one species to two, and then how we go from one species to no species. And so this right here is a Taposaurus. Uh, it's a sauropod that was found in Brazil, and you can see it right here on this phylogenetic tree. And so if we trace the phylogeny of uh, Taposaurus, what we would find is each of these points here represents a common ancestor of the dinosaurs above it, but because it branches in either direction, that means we're going from one species into two species, and that's called speciation. And we'll talk a little bit more about the mechanisms by which we can speciate, uh, but essentially in speciation you go from one species to two. Um, and extinction is when you go from one species to zero species. And so where do we find on that on here? Well, on the side you can see we have time. So we have time on the side. So this is millions of years ago. And so you see that some of these will end. In other words, um, Nigerosaurus right here ends, and that means that it went extinct. In other words, this one species became zero species. And so in life, we go from that first common ancestor of all life, but we've gotten a diversity of life through speciation. But remember also, along with that, we have a lot of extinctions. In other words, the survivors uh, are surviving on the, on the backs of those that, that don't survive. And so this video is really only about two things, but it'll be a little more in detail than that. And so how do we get um, new species? That's through a process called evolution, or uh, it's biological evolution, or change within a gene pool. So there are two things kind of in play with speciation and extinction. In other words, when one species becomes two, that species is evolving or changing or separating into two populations that are reproductively isolated. Um, and so evolution can give us diversity, but as that environment changes, it can force speciation, and that environment can also force extinction. And so there's this play between evolution, environment, and then speciation and, and extinction. This, remember, creates more diversity, and this actually creates less. So taken to these extremes, one specific type of speciation where you see incredible, a rapid uh, rate of, of speciation is called adaptive radiation. That usually opens, happens when we open up a new niche. And uh, likewise, when you have a bunch of extinctions at one time, we call that mass extinction. And we've only had about five of those. Um, through the history of life on our planet. So let's start with speciation, and let me give you a real example of that. And this is the three-spined stickleback. Uh, three-spined stickleback, and the study I'm looking at here was in Loberg Lake, which uh, to kind of orient yourself, here's Anchorage right here, so we're in Alaska. Um, Loberg Lake is right down the road from Wasilla. Uh, and so uh, speciation occurred in uh, the stickleback, or is occurring right now in the stickleback. Uh, the three-spine stickleback has three spines that go out the back, but there are actually two different phenotypes or two different varieties of stickleback. This would be a low-armored stickleback, and it's found usually in a freshwater environment. But if we were to look at the stickleback, uh, the marine stickleback that spends half of its life in the ocean and then comes back to actually breed, it'll have more armor on it, so it'll actually have larger spikes. It'll have additional spikes down here. And then they have plates on the side. So there are plates on the side of the stickleback that go all the way back here. And so this would be what we call a fully armored stickleback. And then if I get rid of the uh, coloring, that'd be a low armored stickleback. Okay, so a, a natural experiment was done in 1982. So in 1982 in Loberg Lake, we'll say Loberg Lake looks like this. Almost all the sticklebacks in Loberg Lake were of the uh, low armored variety. In other words, they were just this fresh water. And so what happened in um, 1982 is that they poisoned the lake because sticklebacks don't really have a purpose. Uh, they do, but they wanted to put uh, trout and salmon back into the lake, and they wanted them to grow. And so they poisoned everything in the lake, so they killed all the, the sticklebacks. Um, so there were no sticklebacks in the lake, so it's a great kind of an experiment. Um, what they found is that over the next few years, fully armored sticklebacks were making their way into the lake, and so they were making their way probably through streams and, and out from the ocean and making their way back into the lake. And so what we had in here was fully armored sticklebacks and over the next few years, their population started to grow. Eventually, they started to notice, hey, there's fully armored sticklebacks in here. And so what they found then over the next 
few years is, is puzzling. In other words, the fully armored sticklebacks started to drop off, their numbers started to drop off, and then they started to see an increase in the low armored stickleback. In other words, their population started to increase to the point where if you go to Loberger Lake right now, you're gonna find almost all of the low armored sticklebacks and not many of the fully armored. And so this is a kind of a cool experiment where you can actually see speciation taking place. Now, why would you see that? If you think about it, for me, I would think, man, more armor the better. Why wouldn't I want as much armor as I can? But the predator that they were facing was um, one of the most scary predators in all of science if, if you were small. So this right here is a dragonfly larva. And so dragonflies, remember, are very beautiful, but they spend a lot of their life underwater and they f form it as a uh, nymph or, a, or a, a dragonfly nymph and so or, or larva. And so this is one hunting. This is a video from a David Attenborough movie. So let's watch him feed. Wow, okay, that's a little disturbing. And so the uh, dragonfly larva is the uh, major predator in Loberg Lake. And so the low armored sticklebacks actually grow faster than the fully armored sticklebacks. And so the fully armored sticklebacks were being preyed upon at a greater rate by the dragonfly larva than the low armored sticklebacks. And so we had natural selection taking place. And so what we're starting to see is a change in that. Now, eventually, if fully armored and low armored sticklebacks can't interbreed, then we have those uh, as a separate species. And so on that tree of life, we can go from one branch to two. Now, again, taking to its extreme, we can have what's called adaptive radiation. And so once you have a new environment where species can take off and there's no predators, you get a huge amount of diversity. And so when we talk about evolution, we have a tendency to, to fixate on the Galapagos Islands and, and neglect the Hawaiian Islands. And so this is a great picture right here of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, but what we found is that it was hard for a lot of species to get to the islands. Mammals weren't gonna make it, but birds could make it easily. And so the honey creeper is an example of a bird that just went crazy on the on the Hawaiian Islands. And so we think the ancestor of modern day honey creepers was a, a bird that looked like this. It was somewhat similar to a finch, but once it arrived on the island, it was a founding population. You got this huge diversity of all these honey creepers. You can see their beaks are each of them adapted probably to a different flower. And so we had adaptive radiation. So we had this new niche show up, this new environment, and they exploited, or excuse me, we had this new environment show up and they all exploited all these different niches. Um, and so you had this great diversity of, of of honey creepers. Now, a lot of these are pictures and not actual photographs. And the reason why is that humans showed up. And with humans, then we had predators that showed up and they started to uh, make a lot of those species go away. And so extinction started to show up as well. What's another famous adaptive radiation? Well, I can think of a couple. Um, one would be uh, the arrival of um, mammals. And so once the dinosaurs went extinct and mammals were able to grab a foothold, they adaptively radiated to fill a bunch of different uh, niches that were once filled by dinosaurs or adaptive radiation. We could also see in the Galapagos as they move from island um, to island, like the beak of the finch, uh, which is just one population on the Galapagos. Now, this flip side of this podcast is the idea of extinction. And I love this quote right here. It's the idea that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. And so these are some species, the auroch, the quagga, the great auk, the thylacine, or the Tasmanian wolf. These are all species that have gone extinct uh, just in the last few hundred years. Um, and, and they did that as a result, a lot of these as a result of human pressure. This would be a golden toad uh, that went extinct in the 1980s. And so if we look on this tree of life, each of these branch points here would be an area of uh, speciation, but each of these endpoints would be an area of extinction. In other words, that, that once you have that last organism die of that species, um, then you can't pass that on, those genes on anymore, and so we would say it's extinct. Now, the things that are alive today are called extant, but if we look through the history of life, we find sometimes that there are massive extinctions, extinctions that go across all. All right, scientists have identified five different mass extinctions uh, over time, and they're labeled here with these yellow triangles. This would be the Ordovician Silurian extinction. This would be the Late Devonian um, this is the Permian-Triassic extinction. This would be the Triassic-Jurassic.
Jurassic extinction, and then this right here would be the Cretaceous tertiary extinction. And so what makes a mass extinction? It's, a, it's an extinction where the, 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 the rate of extinction is just dramatic. Um, and so we also have other extinction events here within this. Um, this one, a couple of, of interesting ones that you maybe know about. This right here would be the Permian-Triassic extinction. This one is known as the um, Great Dying. And so of all the extinctions, this is the biggest one. Um, during the Great Dying, something like 70% of all land species and 96% of all marine species uh, went extinct. Um, and there are a number of different causes of that, probably. The one extinction that almost everybody's familiar with is the KT, or the Cretaceous-Triassic extinction, uh, or tertiary extinction. And so that's the, the one where the dinosaurs actually went away. And so with all of these extinctions, scientists are trying to piece together what actually causes it. And so a lot of these are um, suspects. In other words, the great dying formed at the same time when Pangaea actually formed. And so scientists think that that had something to do with it. But it could have also been volcanoes. It could have also been oceans losing their oxygen. And so these are all the different types of characteristics that could have led to mass extinction. And so scientists are kind of piecing those together and figuring out which one of those um, caused each of these different extinctions. The one that uh, I want to talk more about specifically is the KT, KT extinction or the Cretaceous tertiary extinction. Um, and the evidence there is pretty good. This is where dinosaurs go away. Um, it's probably not super, super accurate to say that. There's a lineage of dinosaurs that continues today, and those are called birds. Um, and so birds, have, it's, a, it's a lineage of dinosaurs that continue today, but most of the dinosaurs actually disappear at that time. And so the point in the fossil record where they disappear is sometimes referred to as the Cretaceous or the KT boundary. Um, and, and if we look below that, we find dinosaurs. And if we live a, look above that, we find no dinosaurs um, in the fossil record. Now, you've probably learned that there was a giant asteroid that hit around that time, and we think that it hit in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. We've actually isolated where that, um, that crater is. But what evidence would we have to show that this actually exists? Why isn't it something else like climate change, for example? Well, one piece of evidence is that down here we have uh, dinosaurs. Above here we have no dinosaurs, but we also have a level of iridium that goes around the planet. So a thin layer of iridium that's found along this KT boundary. Iridium is really rare on our planet. It's not very common, but in asteroids it's incredibly common. And so that's one piece of evidence that suggests that um, this asteroid input pack could have led to the, uh, uh, the disappearance of the dinosaurs. And so that's an extinction. And so again, to, to summarize, we've got speciation, where we make new species, extinctions, where we uh, get rid of those. Um, and they're big at some times, and their rates are really uh, high at some times and really low at other times. And mostly that has to do with changes in the environment. Um, and so I hope that's helpful.